try to give everybody a few minutes to just kind of get settled, but um, I know we only got an hour in here, so I'm going to get started pretty quickly. Um, we've got uh, disaster response and recovery at the local level uh, is what we're going to be talking about today. The basic idea behind this is just sort of examine the different roles that people have at the uh, state and local levels in the disaster response, which can differ fairly significantly from some of the federal stuff that people are typically a little more familiar with. Um, also, we're going to try to examine a little bit how those different components of local response um, are able to collaborate, uh, look for opportunities for how it can be done better in the future. Um, without much more, I'm going to start our introductions. I'm going to begin from the bottom and go up because if I start from the top, um, Jason Susella is not here, so that would be very disappointing. Um, first, we have uh, Joe Boris from uh, Pinellas County Emergency Management. He's their response recovery manager. Um, we also have Stephanie Stakowitz, who's general counsel for the Florida Division of Emergency Management. And Michelle Luckett, here in the middle, uh, with the uh, Be Ready Alliance. She's the uh, CEO of Brace, also does some work with uh, the Florida FOAD. Uh, I'm gonna start out with Joe, if you wanna give a brief introduction for yourself. Hi, I'm Joe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, Joe Boris, I uh, work for Pinellas County Emergency Management. Uh, last 25 years working on uh, hurricane response and technology improvements along that area. Um, response recovery is uh, in my domain for the, the department. Um, there's 14 of us, um, sorry, 15 of us uh, uh, working on recovery for a million people. So it keeps us busy, um, lots of programs. Uh, we're taking a lot of lessons learned from Ian. Uh, of late, so just be prepared for all hazards. Stephanie? Hi, I'm Stephanie Sarkowitz. I'm the general counsel for the Florida Division of Emergency Management. I'm very happy to be here. I'm actually from St. Petersburg, so uh, it was nice to come home, especially and bring my kids to be with my family uh, for spring break. I've worked for the division for three and a half years now. I've loved every minute of it, but as you know, we've been very busy with different emergencies. Um, I work under Director Guthrie, and we were very involved for these last several emergencies, and so we really haven't seen any blue sky yet, but I look forward to sharing our experiences and, and how we've worked with local partners. Michelle? Okay, so hi, I'm Michelle Luckett. I need everybody to stand up. Stand up, stand up, stand up. <laughs> All right, we just had lunch. Stretch, good stretch, good stretch, good stretch. Shake your hands up. All right, now I can say I've shaken everybody's hands. <laughs> All right, hi, I'm Michelle Luckett. I am the uh, CEO for the Be Ready Alliance, coordinating for emergencies, or GRACE. I am also the vice chair for the Florida VOAD, which is Voluntary Organizations Active in Disasters. At the end of the day, I'm an educator. I'm an advocate, and I love my job. Everything about it. I've been fortunate to work with this gentleman here and this wonderful woman on this side. And so I think it's kind of ironic that I'm in the middle between county government and state government because that's where the VOADs reside. We are the bridge to pull all of this together because you're going to hear it a dozen times if you haven't heard it already. All disasters start local and finish local. And so I am super excited to be here today. Um, this is my fourth speaking event in two weeks. So if I look at you funny, it's probably me trying to remember if I just said it or if this is the first time you've heard it. So um, with that said, it's all you. Thank you very much, Michelle. And I forgot to uh, introduce one more person. That would be me. I'm John Wallace. Uh, I'm a staff attorney at Bay Area Legal Services on the Disaster Relief Project. Um, what we're going to be doing here is just sort of going round robin with a series of questions, uh, just so sort of ease the, the explanation of what everybody does, uh, how we can collaborate. Um, additionally, if anybody in, in the meantime wants to raise their hand, ask a question, feel free. We want to keep this relatively open. Uh, if we don't get to all the questions that we have prepared, that's fine. Um, it's just better to have that sort of open discussion because it's going to be a little bit of a discovery for us as well. Um, without further ado, oh, one more thing. The both panels, concurrent panels, are being recorded. So if you are interested in what's going on in the other room too, don't worry. They'll be able, you'll be able to see that later, just like everybody else in that panel is going to be able to see this later. So. We'll just start out with question one. I'm going to start and direct this one toward uh, Jeff. And how does local emergency management 
ensure post-disaster recovery services are available to all uh, county residents. Okay, great question. So, as uh, Michelle mentioned, all disasters are local. So it's on us at the local level to take an assessment of what has happened and report that up through the state, the impacts, uh, and then ask the state for a declaration. What we're seeking are two different types of declaration, individual assistance a declaration and then a public assistance declaration. So for the public, for the individual assistance, which is most important to uh, all our residents, is going out there and doing residential damage assessment. So uh, we work with an ESRI application called Field Maps. We've trained over 162 folks, our municipal partners and our county partners from our building and development reserve, building and development review services and the property appraisers office to go out and canvas the county as soon as uh, uh, the event has occurred. Um, we take all that information, uh, we apply the residential damages, so they want, FEMA wants location-based information, so we take that information, run it against the property appraiser's information, find out if we can determine if they're rentals, homeowners or not, the level of damage may uh, destroy, major, minor, or affected. We apply some factors to that to figure out the valuation of the damage to the building. So if you're a nice waterfront, $3 million property, but you only got a $100,000 building on it, that's the assessment and the calculation uh, that we apply that to. We submit that all up in a big Excel sheet to uh, Florida Division of Emergency Management. They take that and collate it with the other counties who uh, had damages as well too. And then they ask through the governor to the state and to the federal government uh, for a declaration for individual assistance. Potentially with that is public assistance as well too. If you have a bunch of residential damages, you probably have critical, dam uh, critical infrastructure damage as well too that's publicly owned, the municipal and private sector uh, included as well for you know electrical, utility, street lights, those type of things that make a community whole. And uh, we take those valuations, line item now as well too, uh, those categories A through G, and uh, provide that up uh, to the Florida Division of Emergency Management again, and they ask for a declaration. And there's three types of declarations, but two that we really focus on. Is it emergency declaration? That's just, you know, something minor like uh, ETA was kind of an emergency declaration. We're going to get protective measures, Category B, funding, um, sheltering, and a few things like that reimbursed. And then uh, you have your major, so Hurricane Ian, where, you know, you get the alphabet soup of support coming from the federal government, uh, comes down from the Stafford Act. Uh, all those funding mechanisms that can come from different agencies. And then uh, that's our job at Emergency Management, making sure that we get all those things that we're entitled to locally are provided to our citizens and to our municipal partners as well and, and to our BOADs or 5013Cs and now churches as well too have been included in that. Uh, well, along with that decoration comes a uh, small business administration decoration as well too. The so small business administration does support homeowners and renters, not just businesses. That's one of the things that we always have to educate the public on because uh, they'll find out that they have to apply for the SBA before getting some FEMA uh, um, assistance as well too. And that confuses folks. Um, so we have them go through that process, but they do help, help homeowners and renters uh, with low, very low interest rate loans. Then we open up what's called, if we get declared, a disaster recovery center. Um, this is where folks that can't handle the electronic process can go and apply uh, in person, or if they have a lot of paperwork that they need to provide uh, to FEMA or the SBA, they can go right there on site and seek assistance. Our BOADs actually show up at the DRC. We try to make them, you know, uh, sometimes there's insurance villages you've heard of, so a lot of insurance agencies will congregate in one area, and then for the DRC, we try to bring in state and local resources there as well, too, that can, can help folks out there. And there's other local programs that are available as well, too. Um, you can call 211 here in Pinellas County, and if they can help you, they will if you don't qualify for other assistance or they qualify for some of that. And then our Unmet Needs Committee, uh, off to the side, is fitting up as well, too, our BOADs and COADs that come in and help uh, the community as well, too. So we're doing all those things as soon as uh, uh, a storm event impacts us. Everybody asks when this uh, recovery starts. It starts with response. Obviously, we're doing life safety first, search and rescue, those things. But we're also working the recovery angle as well, too. Getting, it's all data-driven decisions, so we're trying to get all that data up pass through the state. So we're a sub-recipient, the recipient is the state, and then the feds are the, the, the funding mechanism. That was pretty
pretty comprehensive. <laughs> <laughs> I just started a few times. <laughs> I lost you at Joe. <laughs> yes. um, M Michelle. Perhaps not Michelle. Uh, Stephanie. Um, when the counties actually send that information up to the Florida Department of Emergency Management, do you notice a, any, any particular disparity in responses between the counties? Um, uh, some more are some more difficult than others. Um, levels of education, things like that. Is there anything like that that it tends to affect your response at the state level? Not particularly, okay. just because if um, if there's discrepancies in you know the information that we're receiving, we request more information. You know, when when our recovery team compiles that request um, for the different declarations. It's extensive, and while it's specific to each impacted area, we really try to make it an, a comprehensive um, and make sure we meet all those elements that are required for FEMA. That's true. So for Etta, it took multiple iterations. And why did that happen? Well, we had Sally. Sally happened during COVID. Nobody wanted to go out in the field. FEMA wasn't coming down because we do a thing called joint preliminary dam assessment where I go, look, that's damaged. They didn't want to do that. Um, so now it became the line item, more information, photographic. So if it was a flooding event. If you don't get that picture of that rack line or where it flooded in your place, now how do you demonstrate where the flooding was unless you have watermarks and things like that? So yes, the back and forth and, and the visions very fly about, you know, they're helping us, right? Hey, we need more because they're hearing from FEMA that they want more. So it, it really is a, a conversation, if you will, until, you know, Ian, yeah, that, FEMA saw it, they gave a pre deck they do all that, you know, that was, but Lee County, all them still have to do damage assessment. If you want some other programs, RVs, things like that, you have to demonstrate by the numbers as well, too. So you don't get a slide just because it was catastrophic. And to expand on that a little bit, uh, the division will deploy resources out as soon as um, the impacted, as soon as landfall hits and we get the all clear because we want to catch those damages. We want to be there for the, you know, the joint preliminary assessments. We want to make sure we're helping our partners get that data that they need. It's, it's very important and we work together to make sure we can show those damages um, to the greatest extent possible. And I think that what Florida does better than a lot of other communities, because we are impacted so often and in so many different forms, is that the division's staging of personnel in EOCs that may not have the staffing to support it. So for instance, in a lot of our rural counties, that emergency management department is probably one or two people, and that EM person may be a retired fire chief a retired sheriff or some fashion or form in the midst of that and so when you start talking about a major event for instance Ian coming inland and going to DeSoto County I was there for three weeks Rick Kristoff the EM great guy it's his first event though and he lost 3,500 homes underwater so the resources that the division puts into place ahead of time helps folks like Joe and his team really pull this information together as fast as they can so that we can get things up through Tallahassee to the state. A lot of divisions at the state level don't do that. They wait for the all clear and then they send people in or they pre-stage them outside the community. What our division does is they'll get people down there. Once they have a really good idea where this thing is gonna go, they're there. If it's an after effect, for instance, a tornado, they're there as soon as they can get up. So that's, you know, compliments to the director and to the division because of that efficiency, we can get things going even faster. Right. Thank you, I appreciate You're that. Welcome. And and we do, we, we deploy not just resources that we have, we, we, we're constantly in communication with the counties. As soon as we know um, that there's going to be an uh, impacted area or they're inside the cone, every day we're asking, what do you need? What do you need? What do you need? Whether that's people, or, or commodities. We really just want to make sure they, they have what they need before the storm, and then afterwards we continue to be in constant communication with them to make sure they have both people and resources. It's, it's very important to us. Thank you guys. Um, without uh, any further ado, we'll move right along, and I'm going to put this one to uh, Stephanie. Um, when are those uh, local government missions, the initial ones, taken over by uh, or beyond local management? 
for instance, uh, your own department? Right, so um, like we were discussing before, we do a lot of uh, staff augmentation, so to make sure that the emergencies, uh, the emergency management divisions are um, staffed properly to respond to the initial um, damages and to be as prepared as possible. But we also um, will do logistical staging areas ahead of time um, to make sure that the commodities so what would be needed is there as food, water, the essentials are as close to the impacted areas as possible. So when we um, set up our points of distribution, um, those, com those commodities are very close and we can push them out as soon as possible. Um, you know, typically we see right after an impacted uh, areas, you know, they'll need um, a lot to stand up uh, a, base a base camp or a mobile um, mobile medical units, uh, pods of course are points of distribution for just the essentials are necessary. Um, we just try to help where we can and assist where we can. And, and a lot of times it, 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 it's contingent on whatever, which county, what, what the event is, a flooding event versus a large wind event or for, with respect to Hurricane Ian, a very large debris event. Um, uh, that, as I'm sure a lot of you know, the division took on the majority of the debris removal for Hurricane Ian, and we're still working on that with our local partners. And the city of Sanibel and town of Fort Myers Beach actually asked us to not only pick up their um, private and commercial debris removal, but also their right of way debris because it, it exceeded their capabilities. And so, um, like like we've said multiple times already, it's locally driven. It's a local event, but the state's here to assist, and so is the federal government. And we we try to do our best to push those resources out as quickly as possible. Questions? Kevin? Oh, sorry, audience member. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's about the staff augmentation you mentioned. So um, you're sending people into that county to help them because they're going to be more impacted. And where, where are they coming? From other DEMs or from, um, you know, private um, companies or consulting companies? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, we are sending, most of the time, who we're sending out to the counties are our individuals, and then we staff off our own EOC. So um, Director Guthrie wanted to make sure that we had a lot of bandwidth because we knew this was going to be a large event, Hurricane Ian, and then Hurricane Nicole, um, you know, responding to both of those. Uh, within this, the same couple of months. Um, we took our people and put them in the different county EOCs, I mean, uh, the, like the city EOCs, and then we staff on our EOC with um, personnel uh, from different contractors and our different state agencies. So um, it was a little mixture of both, but we really did try to make sure um, that our, our recovery staff, our response staff were in the, the county EOCs. So Kathy, I'll, I'll speak to that a little more. Um, I'm a deployed asset with the state. I have, I'm the, if you understand emergency management, emergency support function 15 is volunteers and donations. So anything dealing with volunteers, spontaneous or affiliated, and then anything dealing with donations, local points of distribution, all of that, cert teams, churches standing up, all of it. So for Surfside, building collapse, okay? Not a Stafford Act declaration, but all of the resources came. But the planning and the execution of that, because it was so different, they brought those of us in that have some unique skill sets, particularly within individual assistance. For Ian, it's 29 counties, is that right? 27, 27 declared counties? That's a lot of people. And so I live in Pensacola, I got sent to Arcadia, and I was there for three weeks. But my sole function, because it's what I do, is volunteers and donations. And so we stood all of that up. Because of the limitations of the local emergency management, then they brought in uh, rapid response teams. Three folks from Texas, a team from Palm Beach, and then they rotated out because we're doing 12-hour shifts. And then they brought in a team from Minnesota to transition out of response towards intermediate recovery and the transition of the EOC from having all of these people in that room to going back to normal capacity. Whatever that looks like in the three to five months after an event like this. So, so the staff augmentation comes through 
subject matter experts. It comes through voluntary organizations like the American Red Cross has a position in the EOC in Tallahassee. Um, Legal Services is involved in a couple of different capacities as well. And so what happens is, is depending on the event, depending on the magnitude of the event, will depend on how much additional folks have to come in. And so in doing that, then you're really speaking into the capabilities of what's happening locally, and you're not making the assumption that, oh my gosh, Joe needs 25 people, and in reality, Joe's team of 15, they got it. Now they may need something a little bit later, but they're, they're gonna try to balance it out. It doesn't always work perfect. I'll be the first one to admit that. Um, it can be a bit of organized chaos, but that's kind of, that's kind of that was my experience. Add of that? Well, our team name is Coordinated Chaos. <laughs> and, uh, and it is Coordinated Chaos. Um, it's not a panic whatsoever, it's all planned out. My other hat is the Operations Chief of the EOC, and to speak to that is, being lean and mean. So, you know, you know you're know, you looking at your target response <coughs> and how you're going to When we have a big event like you, we ask the whole community to come in, all our partners. We have stations for all the PSFs, um, all the groups that we need in the EOC. They come, we have them hunker down. You know, there's this be safe period where everybody has to be in house because you can't have the A shift staying overnight because the B shift couldn't get in, if you will. So, we need everybody in place so they can relieve one another. And then we mission requests. I always ask for a response and a recovery coordinator from the division. Um, and then they bring someone in there and that's our voice. You know, they're helping us anticipate. We're always trying to lean forward so we know what to anticipate. We're trying to lean forward. What is the next objective or the next operational period? So that's very important to get ahead of things. Don't want to get behind because um, it will slow you down. And we're looking at that staff augmentation. The other thing is stress levels. I saw it for Irma, that there was a two, three weeks for us of power outage for so long with all the healthcare facilities without power, things like that. And then the E and, you know, the fact that it was coming and it was intense and could have been us. Uh, we dodged a bomb, not a bullet. Um, there was stress in this, so you're watching for that too and then planning how to ro rotate these folks in. Because some of these agencies even Duke and all that, you know, they have limited bandwidth for people coming and going. Then can they get into your county? There's a delay in that. So you're trying to balance all that, the right staff augmentation you need. So they say go big, go home, but you want to be lean and mean, you want to build up to it, and you need to manage it as you move along as well too because the stress is real. People get tired. I want people focused. I want them aware. I want them caffeinated up and all that. So you've got to balance it out. You've got to watch that. My branch directors watch that as well too and just be courteous of them and, and make sure that there's proper relief and staffing. And I will say, um, the one thing that Florida, I think Florida does really well, I think we do a lot of things very well, but um, in emergency management, but our statewide mutual aid, a lot of different um, entities send uh, people to assist. Um, so for instance, Bay County, a, a lot of the, the emergency management director, um, some others that have went through Michael, they were there on the ground in Lee County. And they, and they were such an asset for lessons learned and how to improve the response and the recovery. So I was in Bay County, Michael, and the best team was from Oregon. Their hurricane response team from Oregon. I'm like, Go Ducks! They were so knowledgeable. They, they were so knowledgeable. I knew, hey, I need mean, this book. They were on it. You know, there were other teams from Mississippi. You know, they had been through there, been there, done that, and other locations. But it's unbelievable when they rotate in there, and they're, and they're a great help. And just, I need this. Boom, they're on it. Um, yeah, so and I know that happened in, in, for Lee County as well too, some of those same states, those same teams. Not maybe the same personnel, but that team because, you know, you got to muster a team up, right? So you have 60 people to hope to get 14, 16 on a team that can travel for that period of time. Yeah, and our, our EMAC uh, assets are really great as well. We have individuals from tennis, what EMAC is. emergency <laughs> management <laughs> assistance, humpback. So any, all the different state resources, so like state to state, state to state. So Oregon, Tennessee, um, we have we had those individuals in our EOC helping us with, you know, emergency contracting, finding resources, you know, a lot of times for emergency management, and this is one of the first things that I tell my attorneys um, when they come on board, we're all hands on deck. We don't just review, we don't just review legal documents. We draft those documents. Sometimes we're calling to get a follow-up. Have you seen this? Do you have any questions? I mean, sometimes I act as a secretary. I, it's whatever needs to be done, however we can accomplish, accomplish this mission, we, we, we do it, no matter what it takes.
And I love that about emergency management. All right, we're almost about halfway through already, so I'm going to move right along. <laughs> um, Michelle, oh, uh, we saw a lot of this in particular with, uh, with the, this latest store. Um, can you talk a little bit about the challenges in uh, providing recovery services, just readiness for uh, urban communities and rural communities? We went right through Fort Myers to the middle of the state this time. Sure. Okay, so you've heard me speak to it a little bit, and that is rural community capacity, right? When you go into a community that is traditionally isolated, they're isolated because of geography, they're isolated because of cultural issues, there is a disparity between what you see in an urban community versus a low attention urban community or suburban community. So for instance, here in Pinellas County, it would be, um, well, we'll take where we are. Gulfport versus City of St. Pete. Okay, so if you have a flooding event in downtown St. Pete, you're also, I guarantee you, you're going to have a flooding event here, right? Because it's lower. But where's the attention going to go? The media is not going to know where Gulfport is. Donors, unless they're from the area and they've got a local identity association, those resources will go elsewhere. When you start looking at rural communities, You've got the reality that you've got limited people, you've got limited depth of knowledge, not a lack of it, but just a limitation because of the number of people. You've got limited financial resources. And because of those proximity issues, the value of social capital is rapidly increased. You have to understand what social capital is and what it does within low attention and rural communities. And if you don't know what social capital is, it's that power dynamic between a bonding relationship, like Melissa and I just met. And what's really cool about Melissa is that in Pensacola, she's two blocks from my office. We have a bond. We've got something in common. But when I take Melissa and me and Kathy, who I've worked with Kathy for five years, from Irma to today, now we've got a bridge event because Kathy's in Tallahassee, but we're on five different phone calls together at least a month, at least. But if you don't know that about the three of us and you try to butt into our conversation, depending on how social we are, you're either going to get in eh, or I'm going to put my arm around you like I did Melissa and be like, hey, how's it going? Okay. Close communities, close cultures do not do that. So when Surfside happened, 60% of the victims and the families impacted were Orthodox Jews. There are very strict cultural guidelines. Okay, In Latino communities, as much as I love the division, and I'm one of the biggest advocates for it, if they walked in to a migrant community with their jacket on, you're not getting anything done. Why? because of fear of the government. Right, wrong, or indifferent, we're not gonna get into the politics of it. But that misunderstanding or the perceptual difference creates an inability to bring resources into the community. If you do not understand the importance of social capital and the work that we do in disaster recovery, you are missing 75% of the game. It doesn't matter how much you've got up here, how much you know about resources, if you do not know how to interact with individuals who are different from you without having a patriarchal mentality, without having the savior complex, that inequity is going to continue. Even the best intention programs. So I'm gonna give you a real life example. Brick, correct me if I'm wrong, Building Resiliency in Communities. Okay, it's a FEMA program, came out in 2020. It was designed for special, low attention, disadvantaged communities. That's the target, okay? First inaugural cycle, yay, $377.7 million went out. That's awesome. No, because only 7% of that, $24 million, actually went to the targeted community the program was written for. When you look at it in statute, it's like, oh my God, this is great. 
when you look at the adjustments in the original statute to increase the caps, you think, yeah, this is great. But where everybody missed, and then they missed it again the following year, the Biden administration came in and said, hey, we're going to issue an executive order, and it's Executive Order 14008, which creates Justice 40. And what that says is 40% of the brick money is going automatically to those communities. Like, all right, we got this. No. Nah. The next, over two years, the Center for American Progress, which all of you know is a bipartisan think tank, said, guess what? 80% of those dollars did not go to those communities. They went to wealthy states and urban areas. So then you sit there and you ask the question, why is this happening? Why can't we get this right? I'll tell you why. Because nobody has stopped to say these communities do not have the people, the time, the resources to go through a lengthy FEMA grant. They don't. So what's happening is the process in itself creates an inequity. And so yeah, you get the big consulting firms, Haggerty, IEM, and others come in and they try to assist, and they do. There's, a, there's, a not, there's an organization here in Florida called OVID. Um, it's run by a lady by the name of Julie Dennis. And Julie um, is an amazing person. Her whole organization's mission is to help write grants to support these communities. Because she knows they don't have the resources to do it. And so when you start talking about recovery services and equity, you have to take into consideration the social capital involved. If you come in and you are in your Gucci Gulch, you know, your nice suit, button-down tie, and you have just walked into Marathon, Florida, you're going to get laughed out of the county. Because nobody in the Florida Keys wears a suit and tie ever. Right? Kathy? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so the reality is you've got to pay attention to those nuances. Because if you don't, people are not going to listen. And by default, they're not going to get the resources they need. We had a similar experience in Eastern Kentucky. Massive floods. Everybody went in there and tried to help. We won it. We got it. Because the people going into those communities did not speak the language. And if you can't broach that, ladies and gentlemen, you're not going to get anything else done. So the inequity, in my opinion, yeah, is there certain services go in certain places? Yeah, but why? Why does that happen? And nobody has stopped in this industry to say, you know what, maybe our entry point is not correct. So then you get amazing people like Joe that sit and they plan and they coordinate and they build relationships in blue skies so that when stuff goes sideways, those relationships are already built the community has a trust with emergency management. The community has a trust with the division. And we can get things done. But if you don't build those relationships and understand those nuances going into it, it's not going to happen. End of preach. I <laughs> <laughs> um, actually have a couple of things I probably want to say about that. But I think I'm going to save that for the uh, next question because I think it's going to dovetail pretty nicely. I'm going to put this one to Joe initially. Uh, what are some of the biggest hurdles for survivors in receiving uh, post disaster support? So my brick application was turned down. Oh, <laughs> I was making sure about the poverty index. <laughs> um, I think speaking, it's very similar to the brick program. So yeah, you can apply for a grant and all that, but also you have to be able to manage that grant too. So the being able to manage that, so yeah, you have nice application, but they're reviewing it to see if you could actually implement it and you have the matching dollars. It goes with that. So for survivors, it is about the application. And so many are sophisticated. They get online and they can fill it all out. And then if you might, you know, sometimes you're good, the inspector comes out, your house is a slab, you're not there anymore, you're gonna get some information, uh, requests from FEMA, and being able to understand those financial terms, being able to provide the documentation. Let's say you weren't a good record keeper to start, but let's say all your records are gone down the street somewhere. You know, there's that. So the equity with that, 
where folks have the sophistication and the financial wherewithal to be able to apply for that assistance. And that assistance that you get, the individual and households program from FEMA, it's just to give you a leg up to get you started. It will not make you whole, it will not rebuild your home. You know, then you add in insurance as well too, being able to describe your insurance, uh, stick, what you have to FEMA as well too, because they're gonna deduct that as well too. So it's a lot of that. That's what the disaster recovery centers are for. So people can come in there and, and be walked through and ask for their paperwork and things like that. But there is an equity. I know there's an equity because we work with Dr. Brunelli Dixon from USF here in St. Pete. And she gets out in the community and she tells us all the time, yeah, you know, you heard me speak, or somebody said, I lost you after Joe. And that's what happens to the citizens out there as well, too, that they're lost in all the, the mantra and everything, that the, the nomenclature that we're speaking. So being able to speak and provide that assistance, too, and be able to walk that walk, and yes, don't come in, you know, with your shirts on and things like that. After a tornado, I put on a jacket that, that I wasn't even paying attention. It was drizzling, so I put in a thing in the back, and I heard some people say, look, FIBA's here. And I'm like, it's here? I'm looking around now. And Clayton, Clayton, my buddy, goes, you got FIBA in the back? I was like, oh, my God. And I was like that off quickly because people see, think FIBA, and they're going to come, and fuckloads of money and things like that are coming. It isn't. It's a whole process. That whole, I mentioned about the, the Small Business Administration having to apply for that. People, whoa, I don't want a loan. You know, I can't get loans. I have, you know. That, it stops them from applying for assistance. And again, it isn't a lot, but it is something to help them get started. So, you know, having that assistance, and then for smaller events, we're on our own. You know, if you don't get the decoration, you'll say you get, oh, we got an emergency decoration. Well, that's really great, but that doesn't open up the fountain of support. Even that fountain of support is not enough to make people whole. So understanding insurance as well, too. Uh, is very important um, for making sure that you know our VOAD, so those unmet needs, even for Ian right now, this is about the time they'll start to bubble up in our community here. Believe it or not, we were impacted, not like down south whatsoever, um, but there were wind damages, um, tree branches, holes through roofs, things like that. What we'll start hearing is from the building permit people, things like that, code enforcement, hey, still tarp on, things like that. And that's when we'll reach out to the VOADs and things like that. So trying to be equitable, trying to reach out. Um, and I think there's a question maybe to touch on that and how we do that process as well too. But it's, it's a challenge for folks. So how do we you know, engage legal services? They can't do it all. Everything's not a legal issue. It's more of an understanding issue of the terminology and what they need as well too. Okay, so the other thing is that the FEMA application is written at a 13th grade level, okay, 13. The individuals who are going to need the assistance, just based upon everything you've heard today and we'll hear again tomorrow, the education level may not be there, the fluency may not be there. So what the challenge then becomes for you as guidance is to be able to take complicated language and put it in such a way that the person understands it and doesn't see it as an inhibitor in moving forward. One of the reasons people don't understand the SBA loan as a step in the process is they hear SBA and they're like, I'm not small business. So we were talking, Alyssa and I were talking about you know, pre-storm, pre-season awareness and what that does. But again, if you cannot speak at the level of your audience, you guys know this, you, you deal in communications. But if you're talking here and you're dealing with a first generation immigrant family, the English fluency is not going to be there. I don't care what language it is. And so the challenge is, how do we move these individuals through the process so they can get the support that these folks are working so diligently to bring to the table? That falls on you and me. Well, I, uh, yeah. Now, FEMA says they're changing their application. They understand it's a third, 13, grade 13. They want to get it down to what, what, what do y'all think the chances of success are that? Well, I think it's going to happen. So, so, in my opinion, Nan Curvis is behind it. Mm -hmm. Eric Nan Curvis is the FEMA Region 4 Mass Care Supervisor. He's out of Atlanta. He's also our guy here in Florida. He's amazing. He is good. He is amazing. And he looks like Santa Claus. And he's 6'7", six, I'm 6'1", six, so I don't look up to a lot of people, literally. Um, but awesome human being. Um, he is leading this effort. 
because he knows it's an inhibitor, particularly in our region, given the number of immigrants, given the number of migrants, given um, educational disparities between urban communities and rural communities. And so he is really driving that process with the Mass Care team. So I, I'm hopeful. I mean, I, and you know me, Kathy, I'm one of the biggest skeptics she'll ever meet. So we'll see. We'll see. I don't know if it's going to happen by storm season, though, but, yeah. you know. Yes, sir. Uh, <coughs> for the Facebook. See. So um, I think one, many of the artists, people on the other side, are, for example, they have to understand the community they are serving. For example, if you have a many clients or survivor that speaks Spanish, uh, we as a program always request team right. to send and to fly in person that speaks Spanish. At EM here in Florida, but at the same time of Viola in Puerto Rico. So in Puerto Rico, we have many English speaking female personnel only. So you can imagine the problem we have to the yes. to serve that those will survive. Also, we, we work about 12 days without any electricity in Puerto Rico. So um, FEMA was requesting people to file online. How? Right, 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 right. Also, we have a problem because many hearing impaired. So we have to request FEMA to you know, send uh, personnel that they you know, understand hearing impaired survivors. Right. So what they were doing, for example, come tomorrow to see the person. But that won't solve the problem. So those are the biggest puzzles and hurdles that we are uh, final political that we have. I agree with you 100%, and as a matter of fact, Stephanie and I were just talking before we got started about a new ALS program that Grace is going to work on with uh, an interpretation service that's based here in Tampa Bay called AQI, um, specifically to address uh, challenges in preparation and readiness mm -hmm. for the deaf and hard of hearing community, because there is not a thing out there other than maybe seven or eight videos on ready.gov that Q, or AQI did on behalf of FEMA. So um, so we're looking at that. Um, I think the other, there's a whole, no, we could do a whole seminar on the challenges with Puerto Rico. And, but I think the other part of it is that, you know, when you're dealing with certain populations and people don't come from there, again, it goes back to social capital. Do you understand the culture in Puerto Rico and how there's what, 57 municipalities on the island or something? I mean, 78. 78, oh, I was wrong. 78. And how big is the island? Uh, uh, 35 miles by 100 miles. But you can see a municipality, one beside the other. But maybe to reach one to the other would take an hour. Right. Because of uh, all the mountains and everything. Okay, so now you've got isolation issues. You've got leadership conflicts because obviously one community has stood up because another one couldn't get along and now we have our own. So you've got you know this fight of concept. And so socially how do you navigate that as a person coming in as part of that recovery? If you've never lived in an isolated location where you have running blackouts for weeks without power, as a responder you get worn out even faster. And so it is incumbent upon you the responder and recovery person, if you're there for long term, to be able to manage, you heard Joe talk about the stress, with 12 hour operational periods. And then you're in a different culture, they send non-language speakers to a community and you've got now another barrier. So the work we do is awesome. <laughs> All we do is problem solve. <laughs> Yeah, and, I'll, and I, would, I would definitely say one of the biggest challenges that, that we and the, our local partners worked with Hurricane Ian is we really wanted to make sure that we were communicating out those resources. The FEMA uh, applications, making sure we had people on the ground working on those issues and trying to help fill out those applications and for the state programs. Um, I'll be honest with you, I was even just there for city meetings, town halls, just to hear complaints, issues that individuals were having. They, a lot of times they just want to hear that we're going to do something about it, that, that we're here, that we're a resource, um, that we care, and sometimes just events. I will say um, my 
assistant and I both answer calls from the division, we get a lot of complaints. Um, but a lot of times, some of these survivors just want you to hear their story and care and, and, and help them with individual um, issues that arise. So I, I try to do that one-on-one, -on -one and I know that Director Guthrie and FEMA also try to make sure that we have representatives at every town hall, city hall, uh, Director Guthrie tries to go to as many as possible just so he can answer those questions personally and put a face to, to, to his name and, and know that he, he genuinely cares. He, for the first, I think he was on the ground more than any other um, individual from the division because he wanted to make sure that he was answering those questions and addressing those issues one on one. I think just, just listening is a huge part of keeping up morale among survivors and everything that a lot of the times they can calm down very quickly after just being hurt and you can actually get to solutions to the problems. Oh, a big barrier to it. I've had probably half a dozen conversations this week and I've been here today um, with survivors who have just, you know, been exhausted, especially by that FEMA application process, the FEMA appeal process. Uh, because again, the language is complicated. They don't they don't understand it. They really need a guy in hand. Um, and going back to that conversation about access to uh, services, I think a, a good way to really address that is getting out into those communities ahead of time, um, getting them prepared um, with respect to actually getting out there, getting them educated on what this process is going to look like. Because after, after the disaster, they're going to be exhausted. They're not going to have the capacity to retain the information that you're giving them. They are spent. They've just mucked out their house, the roof is gone, they don't have time to listen to the specifics on a payment application. So getting out into those communities, and I, Joe mentioned Dr. Dixon a little earlier here in Pinellas County. Uh, she's been a great resource. Um, we've been working with her to get some of the uh, underserved communities just educated in advance. That blue sky work is really, really important. You have a question? Yeah, well, actually it's a comment because I think you're you're echoing what we see in the pro bono community is that once somebody sits down with a volunteer lawyer, they're happy that they're validated. Someone has listened to them, and no matter what happens, they're okay with that. Um, and it's very similar. Um, I, I think that's interesting. Uh, they just do need somebody to listen to them. And on the, uh, one of the things I wanted to mention on the hard of hearing, the deaf and hard of hearing issue, is that the Office of Civil Rights have, has been after several court systems across the country. It, it may happen that it happened in Georgia. But Georgia, for instance, the courts have been working on access for uh, persons of, uh, who are deaf and hard of hearing. So they've de de been developing plans and implementing equipment plans across 159 counties, for example. So there's a model there for looking at how to deliver, how to develop a plan around hard of hearing and services for the hard of hearing and deaf. And also potential for borrowing new equipment that's not in use in rural, rural communities where it may not be used very often in a court setting. There was just a, uh, a symposium here last week, yeah, two weeks ago, with APUI training attorneys. On, Stephanie, we were just talking about it um, on how to work with uh, deaf and hard of hearing defendants or plaintiffs, and you know what that, how the court system is structured, and and the nuances of of how to do the presentations are a bit different. It was absolutely fascinating to see. Um, I'll give you one other stat. It takes a survivor at least five times to tell their entire story before they can start moving ahead. Which means that's five times that they're going through all of that trauma again. And so you have to keep that in mind it, as people are trying to process applications and get this done and get that done. And oh my God, I got to get back to work, but I can't get back to work because the kids aren't in school. And, and you've got all of this happening. How are you going to help? How are you going to calm them down so that they can move forward in that process. That's actually interesting when you bring that up. Just as, you're, as you're saying that, I'm thinking of our own intake process where people are telling us over and over and over. Five times. Um, and I don't have any specific solution to offer that right now, but that is an interesting point. Yeah, what we found across the country is a number of legal services programs for the low attention communities are going to the faith-based organization as an inroad. And I don't know if it would have helped you with the uh, uh, concerning Jewish population, not, but I mean, having that door open to you. Would and actually, it did yeah. because what we did was we tapped into uh, Jewish Community Services of Miami Dade, yeah. which handles the Holocaust Survivor Program uh, <coughs> for the majority of the country. And so uh, their CEO and their team was they're already known in the community, and so there was an automatic trust within their faith-based. 
community to to respond. They've taught us how to interact because there's very specific guidances, specifically gender specific behaviors, and um, it, it was it was eye opening for me. Um, I'm half Cuban and I have lived overseas extensively, um, but this was a, that was a new experience for me. And so with Ian, what you're going to do, what we learned as well is that in rural communities, faith based organizations are the poor. That's that's where everything happens, and it's like that in a lot of other low attention communities as well. So churches know who needs before anybody else does, and so one of the strategies we're looking at for Blue Skies is. This brace is actually training 167 churches around the state on preparation, which is training, and then readiness, which is practicing that training. So that when stuff goes sideways, they know what to do within their organization, which then helps emergency management plan out in the community for points of distribution, as well as potential sheltering. You know, you've got, you've got a lot of different options at that point if those faith-based organizations are ready to go. So I am a firm believer in the impact of the oil organizations, and I have tremendous respect for what government does in our organization. And a lot of this conversation, I think, is leaving out an important, a both, uh, important component, which is the private sector. And I think there's a, you know, we talk about, um, you know, working with the deaf and hard of hearing community and access to language needs, um, and a whole host of social equity concerns. And I find that government needs to lean stronger, I think, on the private sector, right? And when you talk about, so a lot of stuff, augmentation is done right now, it came up earlier by private contractors. A lot of congregate shelters now in a lot of states, they're turning less to the Red Cross, uh, or at least having backup plans with private contractors, hospital system, whatever else under the sun. And I think the state of Florida does a phenomenal job leaning forward uh, and listening to the people support. I will say the only example I've seen during you know, during COVID, our company worked in 22 states. One state required us by contract to participate in access and functional review twice a week, and it required a resume from a senior person at the company. And I thought that was a really unique example. Um, I think it was one of the first states to have a DEI position, director position in emergency management. And so I guess I would say I think there's a really huge component where government attorneys, the private and public legal aid sector should lean on and push hard uh, there's no reason that contractors shouldn't do ASL that that part of your training if they're running your call centers or if they're running your card rate um, And there's a lot of work in Blue Skies that I think if people ask for a requirement, it would be available probably at no or very slight, probably no additional cost. I think we I agree with you 100%. We have about a little less than a little more than five minutes left, and we're not going to get through all of our questions. I do want to hit this next one though, because I think it'll at least help kind of tie things together. Uh, how do governmental and non-governmental organizations uh, engage the state, local, federal partners? Um, how do they work together? Really, um, I'll leave that one to you, Seth. Yeah, so I think we've touched on this quite uh, quite a lot um, throughout this entire conversation. Um, I will say that the division and local emergency management just generally were problem solvers. So we're not going to know the issues for every storm. Each event is very different from I was on the ground in Surfside, I was on the ground in Ian, Nicole, um, and you know, COVID was a, you know, a, a whole different world for all of us. And what I will say is that emergency managers, we, we find an issue and we figure out a, a resolution. How do we solve that problem? Um, and so, for instance, for Hurricane Ian, a lot of the local contractors or a lot of the local um, entities didn't have contracts to address all the needs for debris removal. And so we piecemealed contracts. So uh, we assumed FWC's contract. DEP's contract, uh, but we worked with our state partners. <coughs> Additionally, we, we engage with private sector debris haulers um, to find out what those needs are for that event and, and we address those problems. So things such as um, trash bags in the mangroves, um, just one-off issues that, that really you can't prepare for um, for every event. You're not going to know what is needed until that event hits. And, addressing those those issues and finding those solutions by engaging with our BOAD partners, our local partners, our private sector partners. Um, we, we really, as emergency managers, we find an issue and we find a resolution. And so I, I think that's 
planning, preparing, and recovering from emergencies that we, do, we all work together as a community to address. I really think that the importance of those flow ads too really can't be can't, can't be overstated. Uh, for for us in, in, in legal services, it's a huge resource. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff that we end up focusing on long term are those, the, the FEMA issues and everything. But there are a lot of problems that happen right after the storm and in those intervening uh, days and weeks um, that people really could use help with. A lot of landlord tenant issues, things that will move quickly, particularly in the state of Florida, um, that we're not able to get to unless we are talking to uh, local partners who are out there in the field because nobody's thinking about calling their lawyer three days after a storm. But <laughs> a lot of the times it just it just helps, um, again, to get out there, communicate, so that we can address those issues before it's before it's too late, so that we're not dealing with the aftermath, we're actually able to do some preventative work. They call the lawyer the day of the accident, though. Oh, <laughs> what? The call the lawyer the day of the car accident. Oh, absolutely. So we have to change the thinking on that. <laughs> More billboards. So, in Pinellas, we embrace the whole community concept, right? So, knowing your community, we're talking about you know, Jewish community, Spanish communities, we have a, a Vietnamese community in Pinellas as well, too. We speak Portuguese in Pinellas, knowing all those in those cultural centers. And with us today is Jessica McCracken, who's uh, running the booth, our table out front there works in our whole community program and identifies all those networks, you know, the faith-based organizations and those organizations and try to bring them together. When the FEMA is just one part of all this. I think we've talked a lot about that, but they do come with the disaster survivor assistance teams that we can target. So I can say, hey, you need to go to this mobile home or during the day and, and meet with them, right? And we want you to go at certain times because, you know, there are, you know, concerns in certain areas, but we don't neglect them, right? We want to go there, we want to provide assistance. Hey, here's the Spanish community. You need to bring your teams and have them available for Spanish speaking there as well too. And then uh, for the hard of hearing and death as well too, we reach out to that community as well too. Technology is helping with that a lot because you used to have these boards you would have at shelters so you could speak and uh, you know technology is helping in, in that area there as well. So there's a lot of challenges, but as Stephanie mentioned, you know, problem solving. So what is it that we need to do for that community, either in print, in media, uh, graphics, whatever it is to communicate what we're trying to do. And then that's one thing, right? So we're good at communicating, notifying out, but what Dr. Canelli was telling you is like, we need to listen too, and hear what they're saying that they need and translate that into action for them. So uh, knowing all those communities uh, that are out there in your county, uh, it, it helps you great, uh, greatly uh, to solve the problems that could befall. Because uh, it's right, what are the impacts, right? Um, one impact you can imagine, it could be similar to Lee County to us, is boats. We're the third largest registered boat, so well, we have a lot of boats in the streets and things like that. Yeah, we'll talk about that. We just don't have a lot of land to put them there uh, when they wash up. Because they're private property, right? So you can't just dispose of them, apparently. Um, <laughs> but you know, helping those that need help and being able to listen and knowing who your community is. We do see the faith base. I saw that in Bay County and I see that here. You know, when we went up there to Bay County, uh, the director at the time told us, he goes, oh, you guys are from heathen country, right? This is God's country up here. But we're letting you come in to help, right? I said, well, bless you, son. Where are you now? Um, and that there is that cultural difference. As soon as you turn to Big Ben, I'll tell you. And, uh, it is the same here in this community. There are those pockets, and then being able to listen, I think, is the most important thing. Not just speak to them, but listening, engaging, and uh, you know, the, and the smaller micro networks work the best. So you may need to do the same thing in different areas, but in different speed and with different personnel as well too. What I never want to see, you know, talking about coming in with your FEMA or your FDM thing, like, you know, make sure we have shelter workers. I never want to have the National Guard running our shelters. People will not go. They will turn around, no, I don't want that. So being prepared for that, getting volunteers for that. It's all important. Uh, you call it perception, whatever you want. It's a social dynamic, and we need to recognize it and be equitable. Uh, you know, don't be um, upset that you have to make a change from one community to the other. That's the way it is. There's nothing wrong with that. We need to help everybody, uh, no matter where they come from. All right, so we're about to go ahead. Um, I was just wondering um, how, how if 
have it all and utilize social media um, to impact your response, not just from a perspective of getting information out, but also gathering information from the community. Because a lot of times you only get what people bring to you in person versus looking in Facebook groups and um, at, at different social, yeah, excuse me, social media platforms to see what people in the community are complaining about or needing or, or what. Are you utilizing that at all? Oh, absolutely. And it's being utilized in multiple levels from <laughs> sort of security to front all the way down and you can base uh, what these devices give away about all of us. We actually use location-based data to look at evacuation rates and things like that, traffic on it. Because every time you say, oh, update all my apps, those apps are saying, hey, by the way, you know, you turned off location services, but we're going to still use it. So just a little aside. <laughs> um, but there is a program from FSU the VOS program, the virtual operations, right. social right. but they monitor that for them. They'll run reports, they have some neat software, and they'll look that out and send us Excel spreadsheets of where people are talking about Ian, or you know, you have to be careful because PC is Polk County, Pasco County, so you can't say PC, Irma. So you're, you're monitoring for all those, but you can glean a lot of good information about where things are. Rumor control is great by monitoring your social media. That bridges out forever, no, you can respond, you don't have to, the thing not to do is to respond, oh, this post, now you just say, hey, information about the bridge is, it'll be fixed in two months. And I'm going to step in just real quick because we're a little past. I just want to go ahead and get to the end where we have um, our contact information in case you do have <laughs> any other questions for our panelists. I don't mind us sticking around for a few yeah, minutes if anybody has any questions. And then Jessica is here. She can talk about social networks. She'll talk to your ear off. Thank you so much.